have to help me with work. Hello. Yeah. 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 They're not quite ready for you yet. She's getting ready to start the meeting. Good afternoon. Welcome to the City of Salisbury Council Work Session for October 6, 2014. If you have a cell phone, if you would put it on silent and um, or turn it off. And if you have a call, if you could please take that in the hallway, that'd be great. Um, exits out the door, one to the right, one all the way around the hall to the left uh, for stairs in case of an emergency. And now we will get started. Um, First item on the agenda is the Salisbury City Census Bureau date overview uh, with Nazreen Kashan. Thank you. <laughs> I, I wasn't going to try that. But if you want to come up and, and uh, join us. Thank you for having me here this afternoon. Um, let me go ahead and distribute these. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. If I could have another one, one absent. Two more, please. Oh, sure. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, I'll go ahead and proceed. I know my, my time is short, and I appreciate it. Um, the, the time you've offered me this afternoon. Um, I wanted to uh, just come here to make you aware that the Census Bureau is always out there in the community collecting data. Um, we, we just released Salisbury. It's a, um, it's a community of under 65,000 people. So. That means um, the American Community Survey, the main data product for which your data are updated annually, um, are, are going to be the three-year estimate for which your community gets estimates for because its size is under 65,000 will be released later this month. So because of that lag, the 2013 one-year estimates for communities over 65,000 are already out. Um, but so I, I'm featuring for, for your city uh, 2012 data, just so you know, you'll get updates shortly. Um, one of the things that I wanted to point out is that the uh, the city's population has has grown um, much more significantly between 2000 and 2010 uh, than it did in 1990 to 2000. In 1990 to 2000, it was about a 15 percent, and actually. was about a 15% growth rate, whereas um, the, the growth rate between the 2000 census and the 2010 census was um, closer to, I think, about 20, 30, 20% uh, 30, growth rate. So um, what's happened since the 2010 census has been conducted is um, essentially that the city's population has flatlined. Um, the, we, you know, we conduct a census every decade, but in the years we're, we're not conducting a census, we're releasing population estimates at the um, national, state, county, and municipal level. So if I can just ask you to use the microphone, that'll be much Oh, sure. You, you can sit if you it, It's probably easier. Yeah. Okay, I'm just trying to forget the... Yeah, I know. It's yeah, who to address, room. yeah. Um, so, so essentially, you're not, you're not losing population. Um, but you, you're definitely, you know, flatlined, modest growth since the 2010 census was conducted. The 2014 population estimates at your level, at the municipal level, will be released in 2015 around between May and June. So th those population estimates at the munis municipal level are always the last to roll out. Um, by January of 2015, the state population estimates will be available, and from there, it rolls out incrementally to the smaller geographies. So, um, with Comoco County, I just wanted to contrast 
year growth with Wicomico County at large. Um, it's, it's, its growth rate from the 1990 to the 2000 census was about 13%. Um, and then between the 2000 and 2010 census, it, it, was a, it was a bit higher than that probably, thank you, um, probably closer to about 20%. And then um, a similar phenomenon has happened since the 2000 census was conducted in that um, this, the county has gained actually, actually it's grown more than the city has um, proportionately, but it's still, you know, it's a similar uh, time series in that it, it has grown modestly since the 2010 census was conducted. <clears throat> So I thought it would be interesting to look at your populations um, up among the most vulnerable under five and over 65 uh, between the 2000 and 2010 censuses. And what's happened is that you've actually grown um, pretty, uh, your, your 65 and older has grown pretty modestly. Um, oh, I don't think I realized that was there. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry, I should have pointed that yeah, out. Yeah, no, sorry, yeah, I didn't know. Oh, yeah, that's, that's actually much better. Um, so you're, you're um, under five, on the other hand, because these are absolute numbers. These are um, your popul These are not estimates because they're from the decennials and, and not from the American Community Survey. So you can be sure when you see a 6.2% different, a 1.1% 1, 1 difference between the 2000 and 2010 that it's an absolute number rather than an estimate because it came from the decennial rather than from the um, American Community Survey. So again, we're looking um, at the 2000, we're contrasting the 2000 census with the 2010 census. And you can see um, the, the lowest bracket is your under five. You can, you can see in absolute numbers the growth of um, the population um, under five, um, somewhere around 700 plus. And you can actually also see that your five to 14 and your 15 to 19 proportionately, um, you've also seen significant growth there. And, and actually in, along your pyramid, the most significant growth is your you're 25 to 34. So this just gives you an idea that, um, and if you look at the very tip of your pyramid, you actually have more uh, modest growth in your, in your senior populations, and, and that actually reflects that earlier slide we saw with the, um, the less growth in your 65 plus bracket. So you could say on average, you're, you're trending toward um, a younger population. That seems to be what these data are showing. So the Census Bureau captures data about um, persons with disabilities. And um, this, it, not only does it ask respondents to the American Community Survey if um, they are experiencing an ab a disability, it asks them if it's ambulatory hearing uh, cognitive or sight. So this this data, because again, you know, as I explained, your your population is well under sixty five thousand. Um, you you get three year estimates annually. Um, you, so the between the years of um, twenty ten, eleven, and twelve, respondents on average eleven point one percent of your um, community reported having um, one disability. Among your residents who are um, under 18, 3.6% are estimated to have uh, disabilities during that time period. 18 to 64, it's um, just under 10%. But then you get to your 65 and over, and you can see that um, almost 40%, you know, <coughs> more than a third comfortably of your, your population, 65 and over, is experience, reports experiencing a disability. So I wanted to delve deeper into that. Um, besides asking if the disability is cognitive, hearing, um, and sight, or ambulatory, 
Um, sometimes um, disabilities are an amalgam of, of events happening to you and your health, uh, particularly among um, the elderly. So the Census Bureau has two other indicators called difficulty with self-care and difficulty with living independently. So difficulty with self-care essentially means, you know, I have issues with grooming, um, bathing, um, things like this. Um, whereas the, the next slide, which will be living independently, would be um, I have difficulty with things like running grocery errands, driving, um, making doctor's appointments, et cetera. So it's a, 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 you know, a more advanced level of, of difficulty. So um, year 65 to 74, um, that's, that 871 is an estimate of the total number of, of 65 to 74 year olds in your community um, during that three year period, 10 through 12. Um, and 108 um, were estimated to, of that amount were estimated to have difficulty with self care. And in your 75 and over, um, about 500 persons during that three year period and about 19 um, were estimated to have difficulty with self-care in, in your 75 plus. So then we have our, um, our 65 to 74. Um, that doesn't make any sense. Sorry about that. I'm looking at the, the, the gap in logic. Um, so you have a considerably higher estimate of, this makes no sense to me. Um, we'll have to skip that slide because of the, the data are discrep it. I'll, I apologize, I'll, I'll try to clarify that for you later. Um, but so now we move on to Salisbury City, race and ethnicity. And again, we're contrasting the um, two most recent census and what you, what you see uh, right away is that your Hispanic population has more than doubled since the 2000 census. So proportionately, your, your, white, your white, not Hispanic population um, as a percentage of your total population has declined. Um, your, your African, your black or African American community has also seen growth, but um, not at nearly the same rate. And your Asian community has actually not, not changed at all during the, that decade. And if anybody has questions or feel like I'm going too fast, please feel free to interrupt. Um, so I, your poverty data struck me because um, in this case, the data sets we're, we're contrasting are um, the two most recent non-overlapping three-year periods. So when you're a city the size of Salisbury and you, you get three-year estimates, you can compare your three-year estimates to prior three-year estimates, but they have to have no years in common. So that's why I have the 0709 on one side and the 10 to 12. So later this month, you can contrast the 2013 with the 8, 9, and 10 um, data set. But in any case, what really struck me is how much poverty has gone up in your community between these two data sets. And so the, the um, bar on the far left is all people experiencing poverty, 20%, um, 21% nearly in the prior three, non overlapping three years to 31 um, in the most current three year estimate. And then those um, in your community under 18 are experiencing nearly, the numbers who have experienced poverty ha have nearly doubled from. Um, 23.7, so about 24 to about 40 <clears throat> percent, and then families are have gone from about 11 percent to, to 21 percent again, a, a doubling of the poverty rate. So, so clearly, poverty um, has hit families with children um, disproportionately, even while for the overall population, it's also gone up. So I wanted to also look at um, media, different indicators across different racial groups. Um, because of Salisbury size and the um, fact that the Census Bureau you know, suppresses data for smaller communities to protect the privacy of respondents, 
I, I could only get it for median income by race and Hispanic or, origin. I tried education, some of the other indicators. So, um, but because of the smaller size of your city and the smaller size of, of your uh, minority communities, I, I, I pulled a five-year estimate. It was only in a five-year estimate that I could present these data to you. So it's, it comprises an average of activity between the years 2008 through 2012. And you can see that the median income adjusted in 2012 dollars was about 39,000 um, for the community at large for a household, an average household in your city. Um, your Asians actually have, a, the, your Asian households have, while they make up the smallest percentage of your community, they, they have the highest average household income at almost 54,000, followed by your whites at almost 43. Your, your blacks um, or African Americans at 29 and your Hispanics at about 32. So this is uh, something else that also struck me that I, I thought I'd present. Um, your home ownership rates have actually um, declined over the last decade. So I'm looking decade over decade because I wanted to get you data with no margins of error. And so your, your home ownership rates, that blue um, bar, show that you've gone from about 34% home ownership to 33 by 2010. And you know logically, your renter, uh, your, your rates of uh, renter occupied have, have gone up um, during that same period from 62 to 60, about 67. So your, your rental occupied rate's actually closer to the national average than your owner occupied. The, the owner occupied rate nationally, um, home ownership rate is about 65%. So um, this is a case where your renter um, occupied rate is, is closer to the national average than your owner, your home ownership rate. You mean that they're, we're sort of reverse, inverse, yeah. inverse, yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Which I, I haven't seen, you know, I, I poke around municipal data all so the time. the rest of the country would be 65% homeowner occupied. That's right. And 35%. Roughly, yeah. Renter. Have you compared that to other college towns? Is that uh, something that's oh, common with college towns versus... Well, that's a, that's a good point. Um, and I, I could get back to you on that. Like, I could look at College Park, but I can't say that I, I have, but... Um, so I also wanted to look at um, your vacancy rates. So I, again, I don't, I, I don't spend as much time in this community as I'd like to, so I'm really glad you invited me out. But in a place like Baltimore, vacancy rates is a huge community issue. So it de depends on your community what your <laughs> issues are. But um, your occupied housing units have, um, have declined a number of occupied housing units. And, um, and then the vacant housing unit rate has actually increased. So um, just to um, set the stage here, the prior slide looked at um, the, the data between decennials. This is the last two non-overlapping three-year estimates where I could get a pretty stable estimate for you, so I used that instead. Um, and so, you know, as, a, as someone looking in from the outside, I, I probably guess this community might have been hit hard by the housing crisis. I mean, so that's what I'm seeing just as an outsider trying to figure out the context. Not just the housing crisis, but we've lost tons of jobs. Oh, you yeah. have? that period as well. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I can, I can definitely tell something happened here that was, you know, up, upsetting. Um, to say the least. Yeah. <laughs> So um, one of the things that I try to encourage communities to do is um, as, you, as you look at your changing demographics, because your data are updated annually, both population estimates, American Community Survey, and obviously the decennial every decade, we also have business and housing data. I noticed that Salisbury is um, reworking its downtown. It has a master plan, and I was, I was poking around the website looking at that. So I wanted to look at, you can look at you can ask yourselves, you know, as our cities, our, as our city is changing, are the services that we want or that we need, are, are they keeping up with our demographics? 
and how we envision ourselves as a city. So I did 21801. Is that most of Salisbury? Because you can only do this. It's a larger part. It's a larger yeah, part. It's the largest part. So you can only do this data by two uh, geographies, zip code or county. So I thought it'd be better to give you a zip code than Wacomico County. So um, in this zip code, for, in 98, you had a, 11 hotels. In 05, you had 11. And then in 2012, you had 10. Um, full service restaurants, so that's where you have a wait staff and a hostess. You had 31 of those types of establishments in 98. 37 and 05 and 36 in 2012. So they they've ha they have increased or, or held stable at least since you know 2005. But really, where you've uh, mushroomed is the number of limited service restaurants. And I I noticed that driving up. I thought, oh well, there's there it is. You know why this number is really high for just one zip code. Um, so these data, the most current year right now is 2012, and these data are updated annually. We should have the 2013 out by, um, I don't know, some, sometime around a March of next year. And, then I, and, and it's not only businesses that um, you may want to look at um, using our data, but you may also want to look at public um, health services. And here I looked at, um, sorry I didn't change the zip code, but um, this is definitely data for um, downtown Salisbury. And, and you can see that the number of physicians between 1998, 2005, and 2012 has continued to slip, decline, um, you know, while your population has grown, while you're um, under five have, has grown. Um, your, your nursing care facilities has, um, have, I think they had some, an apex in 05 and maybe as part of the job shedding that was cited. That was one of the um, industries that declined. And your child daycare services, again, um, pointing out that you're under five, and actually a number of your um, younger brackets seem to be growing. Your number of child daycare service centers have not grown. Um, I have a question about the physicians. Yes. Are these, these are not individual physicians. These are uh, groups. Physicians groups, They're, um, so part of that decline could be um, where they have joined together and consolidated practices, as the hospital has been yeah, doing a lot of. Yeah, sure. If you know that that's been going on, that's important context to have. Yeah, the hospital has been doing a lot of that, bringing a lot of people under their umbrella and, okay. and consolidating several um, types of treatment under one in one facility and. Others have been, uh, for instance, orthopedics. There are almost no uh, independent <coughs> orthopedics left. They're all under one umbrella. Okay. So we're seeing that consolidation rather than really losing them. They're just consolidating. Is that right? Okay. Because that's always important. And you're absolutely right. These are firms. Okay. So if you had people in private practice join a hospital, you're right. They, they would slip off as an individual firms. Right. So it would look like you're losing a lot of physicians and healthcare providers, but you may not be. That's right. And another way you can um, be more certain that that is actually what's occurring is I'm just giving you the numbers, but you could actually look at the firms by the number of employees. Right. So if you see a decline in, you know, an office might have 20 or less or 50 or less, and then an increase, but, but less numbers and big facilities, then you're, you're probably spot on about that. Thank you. Sure. So um, I didn't want to take up too much time, and I wanted to stay within the time allotted, so I just wanted to leave my contact information and obviously um, you know, invite any questions if there are any. What time remains? I have one or two, but if anybody has Go any, ahead. Go ahead. Um, one of the challenges that we hear a lot about, and I think that you're probably a good source to ask about this, is um, counting or more aptly, I guess, estimating your homeless population and what those numbers are. How has that uh, changed in recent years? Are you, do you feel more successful or, or is it still um, kind of an unknown and you give your best guess? So the Census Bureau actually, um, when it comes to counting the homeless, um, they do that every decade, but they don't. But the agency, the federal agency that does that year after year, um, beside uh, 
during non-decennial years is, the, is HUD, Housing and Urban Development. And we, we both have the same approach, um, which is basically to count in the winter when people are most likely to be in um, shelters. But um, or self-reporting to agencies for yeah. help, but if they don't come looking for help, then we don't count. We don't have a count of them. Yeah, right. yeah, and, and I know, I know from my own time um, during a decennial campaign, we, you know, we not only go to facilities on on the day we set aside to count them, but we we work with them well in advance. You know, we make every best effort. They are. They are and remain among our hard to count communities. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Not so, I'm, I'm not surprised, yeah. really. No. Okay. Much of the information that you presented this, uh, from the census is uh, replicated on a monthly or semi annually, semi, semi annual basis by the uh, Salisbury Wacomico. Uh, economic development uh, agent here in town mm -hmm. and that's presented to the business community and to us as well to keep a, a, a tight well a close eye on businesses that have risen or failed or and what the uh, what the um, the labor force is it's 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 quite uh, it's good to have that information right at hand rather than you know every 10 years or you know, well, we're, we're glad you appreciate it because because we're out there always collecting data we we also want our community members to know that at any time household your ho householders in the community could be selected for a survey and anything that can happen at the municipal level to encourage the community you know to, to instill the idea that this is a civic duty that this is part of um, really you know managing our um, our community would de making data-driven decisions. Um, you know, we'd appreciate any any cooperation along those lines. And as your flyer points out, you do work the other nine yes, years. Yes, we're very <laughs> busy. Just that once every that's every right. Ten. Um, and census.gov is a place that they can go to get yeah. additional information. And and just a quick plug. Um, one of the other things that I do um, besides you know just t come and tell stories to communities is I provide data training. So. If anyone in your community is ever interested in a data training to access data for themselves, you know, I'd be happy to come out again and provide that service. Okay. Okay. Um, could we hook Miss uh, Miss Kishana up with Mr. Ryan, so that perhaps he could uh, feed her some data or? Sure, I can share that information. I, I suspect that a lot of his data is being pulled from their site. Some is, some so, is, yes. So but, um, some of it is uh, maybe tweaked rather than right. Uh, with personal knowledge, he like teases physicians it from lots kind of, of places, I think. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, we can yeah, send thank it. You. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much sure. for joining us. We'll see you in 10 years. Uh, hopefully, you'll see me soon. <laughs> <laughs> if I've done my job correctly. Did you get enough packets, Kim? I did. Thank okay. you. I thank you very much. much. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Next up is the standard solar presentation from Robert Bustler. Were you sharing that, Tom? No, um, I suspect they're... Okay. Well, we had an hour for the last presenter. I, I was of the impression it was going to be 30 minutes. I didn't notice, actually, that uh, they set aside an hour. So well, they're probably on their way in, if you can... Do we have everybody here for the uh, Booth Street Apartments? Okay, then we can move to that and we'll bring, when okay. they get here, we'll, we'll just flip flop. That's We're flexible. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. you don't need a laptop. You know, I didn't know you had that. I wish I had. <laughs> <laughs> Next time. We try to share that. Next time. Okay. Maybe we need to put together a. a something we can send to people to say, here's what we have. We've got technology. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, th I think it's okay now. I just closed it. Thank you. Just so they know we have it and what yeah. they need to bring if they want to use it. Because that's a lot easier to see than that. <laughs> <laughs> At least for me. Well, why don't we... Um, here, I'm going to sit over here. That way you can see. Oh, that's okay. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Did have some easels, but 
All righty. Welcome. Well, you will need a microphone if you're going to speak. Please. Hello, my name is Suzanne Brown, and I'm the interim executive director for the Wicomico County Housing Authority. And with us today, we have Ivy Carter from Penrose Property and Patrick Stewart from Penrose Property, who um, have been invited to give a presentation about our Booth Street reinvention of public. <coughs> Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Welcome. Good evening, everyone. I'm Ivy Carter. I'm with Penrose Properties. I'm vice president, run our Baltimore office. Um, we were fortunate enough to be selected by the Wacomico Housing Authority as their development partner to redevelop the Booth Street Public Housing Project. Um, if you're familiar with Booth Street and Route 50, it's right there on the corner. Um, the huge accomplishment that the Housing Authority made before we were selected as their development partner, um, they were one of the first housing authorities in the state of Maryland to be awarded a rental assistance demonstration contract by HUD. Um, for those of you who don't know what that is, RAD, um, it is how, the, um, how HUD is trying to redevelop public housing across the country um, for those housing authorities that are interested in the program. Currently, do I have to speak in, um, in the mic? It's better if you can, but if, okay. you, if you can, it's fine. Oh, okay. You um, can take it with you if you'd like. Well, it'll reach a little bit. This one, probably, like I'm, this one will I'm reach further. <laughs> we don't have a wireless. No. Sorry. I'm not the entertainer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is um, currently um, what the read, what Booth Street looks like. And part of the RAD or HUD program um, is to redevelop the property or rehab the property. Well, we chose, and the Housing Authority has been working for many, many years on a redevelopment program for the site. Um, with the RAD project, we were able to successfully compete for low-income housing tax credits through the state of Maryland. Um, it's a program that's very competitive. Um, we were the second highest scoring application in the last round. Um, and so what we presented to the state of Maryland um, is to take the existing 100 units that are on the site right now. Why don't you prop that right in front of the podium because then the camera can pick it up. Um, we have copies of them here, so yeah, that way okay. the audience can see it as well. That's good. Um, so currently there are 100 units on the site, 100 public housing units. We are intending to divide the site in half, divide the site in half, redevelop 50 of the existing public housing units into 84 affordable units. Um, the housing authority will continue to be part owner of the new redevelopment project, so they will continue to own the land. They will also be a part of the new ownership structure. Um, we will then get a 50-unit Section 8 contract from HUD in order to continue to serve very low-income families and the existing families that are on site um, earning up to 30% of AMI. The additional 34 units will be low-income housing tax credit units up to 60% of AMI. So what we're trying to do is to create sort of mixed-income community where we're still serving the families that are currently on site, but attracting higher income families onto the site as well. Um, we will be coming in, and it's anticipated that we would be annexing this property into the city. I'm not sure city, she's going to be able to hear you. So. Annexing the property into the city of Salisbury um, at some point in the future. Um, we're here tonight to ask for a waiver of the capacity fee um, for the project. It will be 100% affordable. Um, and just here to answer any questions that you may have. Um, schedule for the project, we anticipate closing um, with the state and our bank in April of 2015, take approximately 12 to 14 months for construction, and then we would relocate our families back onto the site and use the existing, the new long 34 units. Where are the, I, I know that this has been in the works for a while mm -hmm. and that, that many of them uh, have already been relocated, but where where are you putting the 50 people that are in the units now or the 50 families that are in the units now? Right, right now, if you could all maybe 50 use the units, microphone. Okay. 
She's oh. taping, so it's <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, right now, um, all 50 units are not occupied. Um, currently, there are only 30 families living in the existing property. So what's happening is the housing, and the reason that is the housing authority is not releasing units as families vacate so that to assist us with relocation efforts. Some families would be re relocated onto the other half of the site. Mm -hmm. um, some families may be relocated into other public housing units that the housing authority currently has. And some may be relocated into private housing um, within the city and the county um, until such time that all the units have been completed. Um, one thing about the RAD program and one of the reasons it was approved as a demonstration program is because we have to ensure that all existing residents come back to the site. So if you're living there now, you will, we will have to sign a lease for the new units with all existing families now. Now some families may choose not to come back, but that's their choice. But we are required by the RAD program to bring everyone back. They don't sell the homes and then have no one to put in it. Exactly. <laughs> like, exactly. Yeah, I like the new place <laughs> Yes. Okay. Other questions? Do we have an idea of how many people this will accommodate? And when you say a family, how big are the apartments and how many people can they accommodate each? There you go. Hey, Patrick, can you give a unit sure. configuration? We didn't want you me. to be totally silent there, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Appreciate somebody. that. I think it was um, briefing so there are 84 units total. It's 22 um, one-bedroom units, 46 two-bedroom units, and then 16. I'm actually trying to get to the page, but that would leave us with 16, yes, three-bedroom units. And are there occupancy limits for each one of the units yes. according to bedroom? Yes, uh, according to bedroom size. Okay. So um, two children in a bedroom up to a certain age limit. Um, we try to make sure that we do not overcrowd our units because it makes it more difficult sure. to manage and damages are, are more frequent when you overcrowd a unit, so we're very careful about Especially that. Especially with children. Yeah, with exactly. Um, and just so you know, um, Penrose would be actually managing the new development um, once the ownership, um, once we closed on the development. Okay, so you'll have a man management contract that won't be under housing authority. Correct. I'll be seeing your plans in the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, I wonder if you could bring up your photograph sure. up to the, to the chair again and flip her around so the present one is showing. Thanks. Um, I want to point something out to you. Do you see, you see the sidewalks are all set at 90 degree angles always, okay? Do you see the cow path that has been made in front of those buildings? That'll happen anytime you do that, okay? Mm -hmm. So what I would do is go back to the people who designed this and say, put sidewalks where people walk, not where you want them to walk, okay? Otherwise, you're going to have your landscaping cut up, the place is going to look like a dump in a heartbeat, and the people that live there are not going to be happy about the way that it looks, and the people that drive by are not going to be happy about the way it looks. So the better you can make the landscaping and the easier to, ma to maintain, the better off everybody's going to be. I'll turn it over this way, and you see 90, angles, 90 degree angles there you go. on this, but <laughs> okay. what we do, <laughs> All right. we get you, <laughs> because we have to maintain it after it's over. Sure. We try to, if you see here, we try and do a half, half part here so that you're not at 90 degree angles. Mm -hmm. um, we also try to do landscaping. Um, we've been doing ground cover lately yep. up against the buildings which is much better than grass, where you have a, a small patch of grass. It looks better. For some reason, the kids respect it more <laughs> than grass. Um, sure. So we eliminate a lot of the ball spots and a lot of the cow paths um, um, in landscaping. Um, Any other Another thing you can do with the cow path concept is if, if there's a place where you just cannot put a pathway, mm -hmm. put foliage there, put a little hedge there. People don't walk through hedges pretty much, so it's uh, they'll go around right. and make a cow path on the other side of the hedge. But you know, <laughs> work with right. that. and we've got a number of um, bioswales. Okay, great. With the landscaping and the, Very the, the routing issues. And community so, areas, do you have accommodations for that? Um, yes, we do. Um, and well, plans we're for. We are fortunate enough to have the park in back of the property. Mm -hmm. There is a playground directly. Yes in back of the property mm -hmm. here. Um, with playground equipment, back of the 
basketball courts. It's let, there's direct access from our property into the park. Um, currently, there's a summer program where the kids that are in the summer program in the park actually come into the Housing Authority building for the summer lunch program. Mm -hmm. So it's well integrated into the residents that are currently living there. Are there amenities for family get-togethers or community get-togethers, such as barbecue pits and et cetera, et cetera? We're actually going to be rehabbing the existing um, building that's there right now. So okay. in that building, we're going to have a computer room, an exercise room. We'll have a large meeting facility. We'll have a patio on the back of the building so that people can get together for outings and things in the back of the building. Okay. And there will be somebody there that's 24-hour management or at least daytime management. We will have management. physical 24-hour management. We will have a call service in case there are emergencies, but there would be someone there during the day. Okay. Um, permanent management staff and maintenance staff mm -hmm. would be there on site every day. When I think about the single units that you're going to have, I, I tend to think of the elderly. And um, uh, the, I'm sure the buildings? Yes, the, the single, single bedroom units. Mm -hmm. I tend to think of the elderly, and I, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, what, what we can do, or what you could do in that case, of getting them out of their apartments and doing things rather than just hunking down and right, waiting for the end of the world. Right. Yeah. Um, we have a robust support services department mm -hmm. that focuses on everybody in the community, not just families. Good. So what happens is when, as people are moving in, part of their move-in package is a survey. So we have our support service coordinators sit down with each family them to fill out what the needs of their family are so we can okay. get a sense of what are they doing right now what are the goals as for senior you know you know what are your medical conditions that you want to share with us what do you need do you need help to the grocery store you know do you like going to a senior center how are you getting there you know what are the things that you need help with and then we also bring services on site mm -hmm. you know so blood pressure screenings a podiatrist Flu shots. So we try to bring things in to the community, not just for seniors and families, but to make sure that they're getting what they need. To what just flew through my mind was when you bring the nurse, nursing students in and they do blood pressures. And I've <laughs> been there, done that, and and uh, that's always fun. Right. And, and to um, be honest, the challenge are the families. It's fun. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's, definitely. It's getting the families to participate. So. Do you have any hookup with the MAC program in the city? Um, which is a county program. Um, if, if the activities director or whoever's going to be supervising there could, could have, you know, dial the phone and, and uh, see what uh, connection you could make with the MAC Center for the elderly, that would be a boon to everyone, I think. Right, yeah. that would be Peggy Bradford. MAC? MAC. Yeah. Peggy Bradford is a contact. Peggy Bradford. Okay. Thank you. This looks like a nice... Uh, I have a question for uh, Mr. Stevenson, if he, if he could. Based on the request, it looks like there's, they're talking about 84 EDUs. What's in our bank now? Oh, do you know? Roughly. These don't come out of the bank. It's, so. it's not part, it's of, not part of the bank? No, no. Oh, okay. This is still county? Of the, uh, this is actually still in the county. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to pursue their uh, building permits, et cetera, uh, through the county offices until such time they're able to come back in and re request annexation. You, when do you, when do you anticipate annexation? Is there is that um, something that I haven't heard about? We would expect it to happen well before we start pre-development activities for the second phase of the okay. development process. So I'd say sometime early next year. Yeah, yeah like probably another year. Started. Mm -hmm. And some things have been started. Yeah, and we've been working with uh, Jack Lennox right. and his folks on this. Okay. There is one, one more thing I'd like to add. We had uh, one individual contact the office today who has um, property at the um, Westwood Development. And I want to make sure that I uh, take this opportunity to mention that um, the Booth Street apartment complex would be responsible for paying a facility fee. Uh, that's uh, a fee that's associated with the um, uh, a, a relief sewer that's already been constructed there. I'm sure that's been communicated to you, uh, but that individual wanted to make sure that that was mentioned. Public Works is fully aware of it. It would be part of their review process when everything finally comes in. Uh, and in addition to the facility fees, um, they'd also be required to pay the 
water and sewer connection fees. So they're just simply asking for the waiver of the capacity fees at this point. And <laughs> Shall I keep going? <laughs> no. I, okay, I, so I, yeah, I, thank Mr. Stevens, I thank Mr. Stevenson for bringing it up because one of the reasons we're here and we're on television is, is to not only approve uh, building projects like this and, and um, accommodate our citizens, but uh, to let people know where the money's going and where it won't go, as the case may be. Yeah, so and thank I think you for that. that. The, the individual that brought this to our attention to make sure we were aware of it plan on being here, but we've flipped the schedule a little bit, so I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Thank you. So, they'll be paying connection fees for the other 34, because they already have 50. They're going to 84. Yeah, so any any time they're going to make have a, a connection of water sewer, they'd have to pay those tapping fees like they would anywhere else. You're, you're just considering the capacity fee right. request. Right, but it's not for the ones that are already connected. Right. It's just for the additional exactly. ones. And what we're being asked to waive today are the capacity fees on the additional 34, yes. not 84 in total. And do we have a number for that? Okay. Yes, uh, it's yes. in the package. Yes, it's 120, yeah, exactly. $120,122. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Value of those additional 34. Um, will the second phase be similar in numbers 50 yes. to 84? Same exact um, identical redevelopment project along with building patterns, elevations. So we would continue. We plan the entire site out. We had to, in order to meet stormwater management regulations and, and all of that. So it would be a mirror of what's happening in the first phase. And even though you're allowing the uh, one area to uh, to empty out by attrition at this point. Are you still taking applications for uh, for housing? Uh, our waiting list is currently closed. Okay. And how long is the waiting list? I mean, in, in numbers of <laughs> applications. Um, the waiting list or the waiting list for the waiting list? <laughs> well, <laughs> we don't know about the waiting list. <laughs> the, waiting list. Well, the waiting list is, is a couple of years, but okay. with this new project, we anticipate that it will shrink fast because. Sure. You also have yeah. other scattered sites that you are rehabilitating currently that will come back online and help alleviate some of that Correct. as well. I guess what I was looking for was um, what's the size of the waiting list in comparison to the number of available units? Um, I don't have the numbers for the waiting list off the top of my head. Then you can't so answer I, my so question. I don't want, so I can't answer your question. <laughs> Thank you. It's okay. That's but I can uh, certainly get that to you. And just to kind of give you an idea, they're we adding do 60. other public housing redevelopment projects where we're working with and partner with housing authorities. Mm -hmm. The last one we leased up, it happened in 30 days. So it's, you know, the numbers right. on the waiting list far exceed right. what's available. Well, those numbers, I think, give, a, give the public a better idea of what the acuteness of the, of the problem is. And, uh, how many people are waiting to get into lower cost housing because their their incomes are Oh, there's definitely a need. Oh. There's no doubt that there's definitely a need. We are not surprised. And What's the It's exciting that this would be a new product that they'd be able to um, qualify for. Right. What's the anticipated completion for phase two, the completion date, for the, so that all six, uh, additional 68 units are on board? Um, the state CDA But if they're signing leases now, for these, no, that sorry. doesn't count. Okay. Yeah. No, what happens is because of RAD, we have to sign leases when we close the project. Mm -hmm. Normally, that doesn't happen until after we complete construction and people are actually ready to occupy units. So in the normal world, we wouldn't be leasing units until or signing leases until 2000, January, February of 2016. Right. That was my question, whether that this process that you have to do the leases under the RAD program in advance allows you to apply sooner and, and move that along faster, but apparently not. Okay. They'll allow us a waiver. We're close. You know, they're like, okay, you're 50% lease. We'll go ahead and let you apply for additional funding. Sometimes you have to apply for a waiver. So it's up to the right. state whether to grant that waiver or not. 
Not to mention that doing the application at the same time you're doing implementation is. Right. They're, they're very generous, and you know they understand the importance of these type of projects for sure. all the jurisdictions across the state. So. Okay. Um, will the demolition and the construction be done by the same company, or are we still looking at bids, or where are we there? Um, we have a general contractor that was um, included in our application for funding by the state. Parkins Building Builders okay. would be the general contractor. They've already actually had a local fair to get local businesses involved in the contracting and the subcontracting for the project. They're a general contractor. So, okay. um, folks are interested, let us know. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I was looking at it from a standpoint of uh, reducing the amount of stuff that goes to our landfill, which is uh, filling up even as we speak. I noticed that the old buildings have a considerable amount of brick in them, and I'm hoping that those will be appropriate re appropriately re reused rather than uh, well, we will sunk into dirt. We will be the National um, Home Builders for green building, mm -hmm. and will be certified. Mm. Um, Good. So, um, Good. that is a requirement of our state financing. And this will apply to your heating and cooling and your lighting and uh, water heaters and everything and everything. Great. But what year were these constructed, the existing? So there's some remediation that will have to happen there. Yes. Yeah, the, the architecture looks at about early 70s. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. You're very welcome. So uh, we were asked to consider today consensus on um, the capacity fees, waiving the capacity fees for that 100, I'm trying to get back to the number, 120,000. 122. $122 uh, for the 34 units. Is there consensus to, to do that? Which are the ones in excess of the 50 that in already exist. In excess of the 50, yes. right, the additional 34 units. I'm good with that, yeah. Okay. So we can move that forward. Mr. Yeah, Stevens. Public Works can put together a, a resolution. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. My computer's jumping all over the place, so when it stops, I'll figure out what's next. Um, we still don't have standard solar, correct? I don't see anybody come in. No. Okay. Tri County's here. They've been waiting patiently. <laughs> so if you want to come on up, we can. Uh, this is for proposed annexation of Tri County Council of the Lower Shore, Lower Eastern Shore. Uh, Mr. Holland and, and uh, Mr. Belichico. Nice shirt. Jeff, Jeff, Jeff Harmon. Harmon. Yes, thank you. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. I guess I'll, I'll start with this. It's my first time going one of these, so oh, well, I'm sure we'll get through it. No problems. <laughs> wait, wait. Okay. Uh, this, is, this is a work session overview on a proposed annexation the uh, city has uh, received from the Tri County Council of Lower Eastern Shore. Um, consistent with the city's uh, 2006 annexation policy procedures, and the uh, applicant has signed an annexation petition. They've paid the fees. Uh, based on the total acreage of the site. Um, it's approximately 27 and a half acres located on the west quadrant of uh, US 350 Wilson Switch Road. Uh, there is not a, uh, a concept development plan. Uh, uh, the property's already developed. It's a two-story two building, approximately 74,000 square feet uh, of office space, as well as 12,000 foot uh, maintenance facility for the uh, maintenance uh, of the shore transit fleet. Um, in your package, uh, you're given a current uh, a current zoning map of Wycombe County, um, one of proposed uh, for the city of Salisbury, an uh, aerial view. Um, what we're asking is the councils um, um, uh, to move this forward to the planning commission. Uh, this is, we're probably looking at this being proposed to be zoned as like business. And institutional. Um, that, that's about all the information I can uh, provide you all right now. Mr. Balchigo is here. If you have any questions? What is it zone now? Uh, I'm having a hard time with the. Uh, what was that? What was the question? 
I, what it was zoned now. I think it looks like C3. C3 is the regional commercial okay. Zoom in, it got a little easier to see, but I see it before. And that compares to what we're proposing the zoning to be? Probably light business and institutional. Is this a roadway annexation? Because we, we, have, we have Warwick connections at Warwick across. How are we getting to it? How are we making it continuous? So the sewer and the water yes. will have to come under Highway 50 and link up to the water and the sewer that exists on the Warwick side. Uh, we've already met with the highway department on that issue and right. come up with a plan of crossing. You are going to bore under. Oof. Right, yes. bore under. Right up here. Mm -hmm. um, and then run lines here and around the back side of the building to our existing uh, sewer system, our septic hookup. Then we're going to take out our septic field and run the water lines around this way and hook up to our existing water system and to the wash rack for the buses in the building. Uh, the reasoning behind all of this is when we're doing the construction for the phase two, moving short transit out there, Maryland Department of Environment came in and said, you can't have a wash rack unless it's on city services. So we are complying with that directive so that we can be annexed into the city and have the sewer hookup to uh, take the water coming out of that. And you know, the state of the art bus wash nowadays is less than 30 percent or so uh, wastewater. The rest of it's clean. Chris Jakubiak has joined us. Welcome. Hi. Um, but you're asking, you're connecting, but you're also annexing. You're, you're requesting annexation of the property into the city. So mm -hmm. um, there's the feedback again. My question is more about how how are we connecting this? Please come forward so that the mics are closer to you. Sure. Thank you. Connecting to the city property? I believe the parcel across the street uh, on the corner is uh, right. annexed into the city, so the adjacency is across so it's Route 50. Via the the piping that you're running under, Correct. Or that you're boring underneath. Yes. So not really. I guess road bed. Is that still qualified yeah, road, bed? road bed? Okay. Okay. Yes. All right. And you're going to get the fire suppression order from there as well from the city. Uh, well, yes. we're going to keep the uh, water tank that we have there that's tied into the suppression system. And instead of pulling off a well, we'll be able to pull off the city water. But, but be fed we probably into it. will continue to keep the well okay. feeding the suppression system with it backed up to the city system so that we don't pull too much city water. Yeah. Have you considered doing it the other way around? Using the well as the primary and the city as the secondary? Uh, I'm sorry, that's what I meant to say. For oh, the okay. water suppression system. Gotcha. Yes, that's what I was no. saying. For the bus wash, will you use your well water and use the sewer as the uh, discharge, or will you use the water, the city water, as your we wash? We haven't gotten into that very deeply yet. As far as which system would work better, and, and the pressure requirements will probably drive a little of that. Because water here's pressure. here's the question that comes to mind for me with that. It would is it because I'm too far away? Is that what? It would make sense to me, if I were you, to use the well water for washing the buses because I'm not paying for treated city water to come in. However, the way we build the sewer and charge you for what you're discharging into our sewer for treatment is based on how much water you use. So if you have well water coming in, we have no way of knowing unless you put a pump, I mean a meter on that well how much you're discharging into the sewer for us to know how much to charge you for that. So that's something that we'll have to we could make that consider. Yeah, I, I know we can, but that's something that we'll have to consider is that there's a, a meter on the discharge side if you're going to use the well for your input. Yeah, it would probably end up being a sewer rate at whatever the dollar amount is for an in-city customer 
because we have the um, in city, the um, urban service, and then the county users. So, right, but, but just knowing ahead. how many gallons mm -hmm. they're discharging, like for instance, with Evo, mm -hmm. they use the well for their brewery, but the water's not going back out into, the, not being discharged into the system. Mm -hmm. Well, eventually it is, but... Well, <laughs> those people pay for that once it's recycled. <laughs> In this case, if they were pumping, uh, it, it's kind of like the car washes, the mobile car washes. If they're bringing well water in, washing off the buses, we don't know what's being put back into the sewer. How do we bill for that? Because right now we don't have sewer meters. We just right. charge the sewer rate based on what, however much water they're using. But if that's not running through our meter coming in, how do we know what's going out? Yeah, I don't know if that's something that Mike has thought through or not. Yeah, that raises a question about our urban services district mm -hmm. and and uh, okay. and the county users as well. You know about the equity in, in how much they pay for their water and sewer services, right? Over oh, their own water, and whether or not we could work something out with with meters somehow. You know, a pay as you go plan to pay for the meter. But, yeah, uh, we, we looked at that a while back. Some, we've got to look at that again. It's pretty expensive. It, it is, it is. It's yeah, meter, meter installation is high, and then the wastewater meter concept really doesn't work all that well. So. Right. Wastewater meters tend to be very maintenance intensive yeah. and not always accurate. And Indeed. so Thank we you. could look at options here where is it less expensive to use well water to wash the buses and then have to maintain and service the meters and everything like that? Or is it just better to use city water to wash the buses with because it is a minimal amount of water in each wash cycle because there's a very large tank that's underneath of the bus wash system and about uh, 70 to 80 percent of the water is recycled for every use. So with each bus wash, we're only using approximately 20 percent new water. So um, it may be simpler to just use metered city water to wash the buses with if um, the cost of, of the metering otherwise to separate the well water and meter that and try and bill for the septic uh, or the sewer usage that isn't captured through the city's water supply well, um, that could get really complicated. Right. So I think that, you know, maybe it... Well, if the well is dedicated to just the bus wash, you could meter that. Yes. I mean, or, or where, whatever outlet it is, you could meter the well probably easier than... than and if only 30% of that goes into the sewer system, we could estimate that. So we'd have and it would save money all the way around. Um, but in the end, who's paying... Anyway, what do you mean? I mean, who is who is paying for the services once uh, Tri County Council moves in? Um, yeah, let me think about that for a minute. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we would have to have an agreement though that about the ownership of that and access to that meter. Obviously, that was one of the things that we ran into with or people in the urban service district that. Um, we charge them on a per fixture basis, because for lack of a better solution. Yet, um, you put a meter. If I put a meter on your well, mm -hmm. is it your meter or my meter? Mm -hmm. you know, and who who gets access to it? Who gets to play with it? Who gets? You know, how do we ensure the the security of the the information that we're getting? Mm -hmm. The fixture method won't work for you because you have a ton of bathrooms and yeah, yeah, that's not other facilities there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Typically, the Public Works Department wants to own everything up to the meter just for that reason so that they can control how it gets used and how it's maintained and, and everything like that. And I don't know if the city would be interested in owning a well when they've got a public distribution system already that they're using. No, I'm thinking I wouldn't think that we'd want to own the well, just that we would want to own the meter mm -hmm. to, to, as a means of, of making sure that there was a fair charge for what, what is eventually discharged? Otherwise, um, you know, how would we know? Mm -hmm. And uh, guesstimations obviously don't work for anybody. Right. <laughs> They're in one person's favor and not in the others, and, and usually not always. Uh, yeah. All of the same time. So. And um, we also would probably leave our sprinkler system on the, the well for the grass area. Right. Right. So that would have to be factored in. So it becomes complicated. 
Well, unless it was split. I mean, I'm not an engineer, but if there's a you know there's a pipe that goes to your sprinklers, then that wouldn't have to be metered. Only the the portion that was going into the bus wash station, so maybe right at the building, that it's metered there. Then you would know that that's what it's being used for. Unless you're going to stand at the bus wash door and spray your lawn, <laughs> you should be okay. Okay. And you'll have city water as a backup for the pressure you need if there's a failure of your pump system. I, I would suggest that you get with Chief, Op, Chief Oppis and, and have him review the thing because that's the end of the curious the end of the system. Right. And pressure is all. You want to make sure that you have enough. Once the fire engines get there, it's not an issue. Yeah. It's that time from the time that there would be initial incident, God forbid, to the time that they hook to the standpipe. There was one fire. Uh, a lady was burning an unauthorized candle on her desk. And the sprinklers worked very well. Oh, no, gosh. <laughs> so created the majority of the damage that had to be cleaned up. Oh, no. Yeah. We were almost there. Yeah. And just to be sure about that, there are no authorized candles. <laughs> <laughs> no open flames. Okay, um, so. Do we have a number for the uh, cost of going under Route 50 and providing <laughs> the infrastructure there? A lot. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, I was working on a preliminary estimate earlier this week for the cost. Um, this exhibit was actually something that was done for uh, the Maryland Transit Authority who provides funding for shore transit and they asked us to look at what was the best alternative. Well, we had sort of done that ahead of time already. We just instinctively knew that the shortest route to get there would be the cheapest, but they wanted to see it on paper, so this exhibit shows that. And um, the cost estimate, and the, um, the preferred alternative is to go underneath a Route 50. The water main, the city's water main, is literally just on the south side of Route 50 across from the site. And uh, the sewer connection is at the pump station for Warwick, right next to the water tower, which is right there next to their entrance. Um, so that is the shortest alternative. And I believe our cost estimate for uh, the pump station and all the piping is uh, around $750,000. Uh, right now for both water and sewer uh, to build the pump station to install the water main. Uh, the city has asked that the water main be upsized uh, for a future extension. So mm -hmm. Tri-County Council is um, going to be installing uh, a 12-inch main across the highway and up in front of their site on Walston Switch Road. And then uh, that will terminate at their north property line where it will be stubbed off. And from there, an 8-inch line will come into their site uh, for the water along the, the north property edge. And um, for the sewer, where we cross the highway, um, we only need about a four inch force main, but the city in the future, when they do a regional pump station, will need a much larger force main. So we've agreed to install a much larger diameter casing pipe that they would then be able to utilize in the future to, run, to pull out the four inch force main and put in their larger force main, which will then uh, connect to Tri-County. So we're working with the city to assist them on getting that future infrastructure that they're going to need as nice well. Nice bit of forward thinking. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Is there, was there a previous pre-annexation there? This is first first shot, right? First okay, this is what I thought. What's the route, the proposed route for running water and sewer to Beaver Run? Does anyone know? It, it's, yes. It's not from that location. Um, the stadium is down here sort of on the bottom left hand side. There's water and sewer there. They were going to run up Hobbs Road and come up to um, Old Ocean City Road to get to Beaver on Elementary. That was one of our options that we looked at was connecting when we met with the county and the City Public Works Department about how were we bringing Beaver Run in. So we would have to come across the creek, across the wetlands, through mm -hmm. Winter Park Place and try and come up to here where they were connecting. And that option was about a million and a half dollars, so it was twice as much money. Uh, so we abandoned making that connection just because it was much uh, more logical to connect over sure. by Warwick. Okay. I'm just at the same time thinking that uh, are there any other opportunities there, just like the house we looked at, was it Jersey Road, the one house that wanted to come in? Is there anyone else in that area? Have we asked anybody else if they're interested in coming in at this time that would might help cut down that overall cost? You mean near the TCC or the Beaver well, Run? Well, between, between Beaver Run and TCC. I mean, yeah, all, I, all of that area. Yeah, I'd have to talk to Mike about that. I, certainly there's nobody right now that's ready to do anything at the Wilson Switch site. I, mm -hmm. I don't know what conversations have been had regarding the 
the extension out to Beaver Run, but I'm sure that's something that Public Works is taking into consideration. It right. seems like the time to do it, mm -hmm. to ask if you're going to. The extension of the sewer and water under Route 50 to the site then provides opportunity for Winter Place and this area mm -hmm. to be served both locations. And so there's a possibility that uh, so an economic evaluation sure. should be done later on to find the most cost effective. Now you have options. Mm -hmm. And so um, you're setting up the long range planning to serve this area with water and sewer uh, through annexation. Right. But I always think about, well, that one person that's sitting there thinking, oh, my septic's failing, or this is happening, or that's happening, and maybe at some point I might have to do that, and they don't know about this until it's too late. And if we simply sent out a letter and said, this is happening, do you have any interest and started that discussion, sure. that then some of those costs, that boring under Route 50 and all that is spread over a wider uh, group and is less costly for everybody. Well, those costs would not be borne directly by the city. Oh, I know. Clear about that now. Um, it's going to be borne by Tri County right. Council. <laughs> but uh, but this, you know, we've done that in the past. Over the past decade, we've sent out notices to adjoining property owners, which would be contiguous as a result of an annexation, mm -hmm. to seek their interest. And uh, the administration and the council wants us to do. And we can draft that letter. We've done that in prior annexations. I don't see where it could hurt. Just to ask. Yeah, I have to. Um, seek advice from the mayor because I know at one point we were, the administration was not necessarily interested in soliciting annexation, if you will, but I understand your point to ask while we're going through the exercise, so I can check yeah. with the mayor. I think it's Maybe a good because idea. it is going to be a dead end and not a loop where we might be able to loop. Am I correct? There's, it's going to kind of deadhead Could there. Could you get closer to the mic, please? I'm sorry to interrupt. <laughs> In discussions with the public works of both the city and the county, it has been discussed as eventually there would be the opportunity to loop together with the system coming down Mount Hermon, Old Oak City, City Road, and then tying in with Walston Switch and coming there. So you would have a, a loop, a flow that could, if there was a break here, we would still be serviced coming that way. But that was all. Someday, maybe, and it would depend on what happens with these areas and annexation. Right. Which is not in our. Yeah, I'm. I'm just looking. I'm seeing TCC. I'm seeing Beaver Run, mm -hmm. um, and I'm just thinking there. There have to be. There's three houses I'm here. I'm just afraid that we're missing some opportunity yeah. there too. Right. There's three houses here, and then there's the industrial area. Right. Here. Beaver Run Park. And then the next housing is not until you get to Old Ocean City Road. And that area in between, the wooded area, is it all agriculturally zoned at this point? No. Yes? No? It's a wetland. It is a wetland. And mm -hmm. it's protected then, okay. So we don't anticipate any houses being built there. No. Correct. Not unless they're living on airboats. Yeah. But, yeah. Mm. Just curious. Um, yeah, if you would check with you know, the mayor about that and, and see. We can't make them come in, but we can certainly let them know what's happening and, and uh, at an early enough stage that if there was interest, they might come on board. Yeah, I haven't done it all along. I'll check. I think that every time we do an annexation, we should uh, sort of reach out a little bit to the adjoining properties just, I agree. just as a feeler. You know, I think it's a, um, a courtesy, really. Well, based on the description of what they were going to do, that eventuality is being planned for by the, so they don't have to go under 50 again. Right. It would just be a hookup at that point. That anybody that would be interested after the fact. Right. Right. Can I ask you a question, sure. gentlemen? Uh, we may have discussed this before I arrived. Um, right at the intersection, there's a Sperry Van Ness sign uh, suggesting that a sale is pending for a part of the park. Yeah. Is that part of your property? Is that there is, there is an area in the front of our property that is a separate plat. Yes. It's available for sale, but no, it's not pending sale. Nobody's expressed an interest in it yet. And it's part of your current ownership? Yes. Okay, so the council should understand that this parcel would be uh, improved from the market standpoint. This development potential potentially realized by annexation as well. Right? So this is not simply about servicing existing building and making a parcel developable as well. This is a parcel that's part of the TCC property that's being subdivided out? 
it was uh, subdivided out when the uh, Tri-County Council did phase one, preparing the bu building when it was uh, the Filtronic Comtech right. and the, the work that was done there as part of that phase one. Okay. They carved out the very, very front piece. And it's still TCC property, so it's yeah. part of this annexation. And this if you, you can't really see it, but there's a little yeah. dotted line here. And there is an access road off, or an access point here off of our road that would lead into it. And that's being annexed in as well? Yes. That whole thing. Yes. Okay. My only reason for saying that is that as we put together the annexation agreement, we have to consider that as well. And in the past, when the council has annexed a, an existing parcel of land, an existing use that's developed already, uh, the negotiations and the, the, the annexation agreements, for most of them simply boilerplate. We know what we're getting. When there's development potential that's realized as a result of annexation, we're a little more thoughtful about how we proceed with annexation and make sure any issues that may Could have. you get closer? I'm sorry. Yes. You, might, you might consider uh, there, there any issues that the city council might have uh, by virtue of the development of that parcel be addressed through the annexation. Uh, typically, those have taken the form of small fees, nominal fees related to the size of the lot or water and sewer infrastructure or access issues. Access. Um, so, you know, we'll have a conversation with the, uh, the engineers here as we put together the annexation agreement just to make sure that that parcel is treated like all the other parcels that have brought, been brought into the city. So things like making sure that they do go in Tri-County Way and use that access point to get to that property and not cutting straight off of 50, that wouldn't be permitted? And As an example, uh, that's right. That, right. Those types of things okay. uh, would okay. be addressed. Sure. And the zoning um, that's proposed for the city once it's annexed in, um, is that... I guess you guys have, have discussed that, and that seems reasonable for that property. I mean, obviously, you're not going to, nobody's going to put a house there, and it's not big enough for a large industrial scale kind of thing. But um, I don't know we that being, we're, we're the, the applicants are proposing a, a zoning change there. I think the county's zoning designation, light industrial business institution, I know it's a combination of that term. Right. The city has a comparable zone. Right. Uh, so th I think that's what we're looking at. And that would allow for the reasonable development of that parcel uh, in keeping with the, the whole neighborhood there. So. And that was my question. Does right. it still fit? I, know, I, I think it would, yes. Pretty much the same, but is it still the right fit? Yes. Okay. Do you anticipate at this time any person. additional buildings on this site? Uh, um, as part of the Tri-County Council, we have... <laughs> there's our the main building here. Mm -hmm. And then there's an open lot here next to it. It's just grass right now. If and when we ever decide we need to expand, that would be the area that has been planned for at future expansion, which is why the sewer line goes all the way around that area. So if we do build in there, we do not have to move the sewer line. Excellent. Um, there is no need for that currently. We still have extra space in the building. <coughs> Right now, it's just if and when, just like this lot up here was carved out, if and when and maybe just to be on the safe side. You never know when another yeah. tenant might want to jump in there. Yeah. Tenant willing to build, yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. At their cost. Their but that is about the only piece of the property that's still developable all besides the front there because of the wetlands and everything else around. We didn't get this one electronically. Could you send that to the city clerk so that we sure. have yes, that as well? Yes, okay. Okay. Any other questions? No. Any other questions, Tom, from the administration? No. But when the cost numbers come in, could you give those, slide those to us if you get an estimate? Yes, yeah. We're yes. firming those up, so as soon as I get them, uh, the estimate finalized, I'll be happy to send you a copy. Great. Thank you. What's the timeline from here? Well, from here, we'll, we will um, coordinate with the Public Works Department and Fire Chief, Chief Hops, to follow up on the Councilman's question this evening and, um, and meet with the applicants. And uh, we have a draft annexation agreement, so we'll have to uh, formalize that, addressing all the concerns. So uh, that can take 
place fairly quickly at the following our meeting. Typically, what we'll do now is seek to get on to your uh, city council work session as soon as possible. And usually that's a three week or so cycle, four weeks. Um, so I, I think we'll, we'll move pretty quickly from this point on. Okay. If, if the, your direction is to proceed with this discussion, we can certainly proceed with it. Okay. I just wanted to make sure we had all that information. Is there consensus among the council to mm -hmm. proceed? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Go for it. Thank, Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Go Did you have anything else? <laughs> bit ahead of schedule and uh, standard solar is, is not here so we're going to strike them from the agenda for tonight okay. and uh, I Are they don't see uh, Mr. Tillman here. Do we need Mr. Tillman for this last part, the closed session part? Uh, Jennifer's here. I think she can get us. Okay. Let's take a five minute break. Could I make sure that... No, I'm just kidding.